Hello and welcome to our next unit focused on hydroxy compounds, where our lesson today is an introduction to alcohols, where we're going to describe the homologous series of the alcohols and investigate their chemistry through specific reactions. Learning outcomes are addressed in just below there. So we're going to keep our journey into different homologous series going by this time looking at the alcohols. This describes a homologous series of organic molecules that carry a hydroxyl group. So we have a covalently bonded oxygen and hydrogen on our carbon chain. If one hydroxyl group is uh, substituted into an alkane, it will have the general formula CnH2n plus 1OH. So hopefully that's intuitive. If we have an alkane uh, and we have CnH2n plus 2, but if we're substituting one of the hydrogens for a hydroxyl, we minus one of the hydrogens, add the hydroxyl in there for a mono-substituted alcohol. Now it is possible to have uh, polysubstituted hydroxy groups. You can have diols, triols. You can have a number of them. We're just going to focus on the primary, uh, on the monosubstituted, and the different classifications thereof, which is what we're going to look at here. So as we do with our halogen or alkanes, we can similarly classify our alcohols into either primary, secondary, or tertiary, referring to the number of alkyl groups that have been covalently bonded to the carbon that has the hydroxyl group on it. What do I mean by that? We've got our primary alcohols, where we have a carbon bonded to the hydroxyl group that has one other alkyl group bonded to it, for example, ethanol. So in the case of our primary alcohols, we have primary alcohol, where we're going to have the carbon with the alcohol functional group, the OH, the hydroxyl, and we're going to have one other alkyl group attached to that. So for example, we could have ethanol, where we've got a carbon that has the hydroxyl group on it attached to one other carbon, therefore it's a primary alcohol. Then we can have our secondary alcohols. You can probably guess where this is going. We have the carbon bonded to the hydroxyl group has two other alkyl groups. So we can draw that out. If we have the secondary alcohol, we have the carbon, but it's got two alkyl groups as opposed to one alkyl group and one hydrogen on there. So the example, prop and tool, we got prop, and we got a alcohol on carbon number two, and then we got our hydrogens filling in there. We have a secondary carbon, because the carbon that has the hydroxyl group is bonded to two other carbon chains. And leading naturally on from that, we have a tertiary alcohols, where the carbon bonded to the uh, hydroxyl group has three other alkyl groups. So if I come up here, and if I do the tertiary, alcohol, it's going to have the carbon with the hydroxyl group, and we've got three alkyl groups coming off like that. For example, 2 methyl butyl and I'm going to go on for space here. Maybe I'll do a skeletal diagram. One, two, three, four. We got uh, two methyl, and we got two uh, is where the alcohol is. So this is a carbon bonded to one, two, three other uh, carbon groups, so that's our tertiary alcohol. So primary, secondary, and tertiary alcohols, we can classify them as. And this is going to have some uh, effects, both on certain chemical reactions they do or do not undertake, um, and also certain physical properties that they will have. We have a number of characteristic properties, as we do with the homologous series. That's why we can put them in a series together, because they share uh, not only a functional group, but because of that, they have similar properties. They have higher, higher boiling points compared to organic molecules with similar uh, relative molecular mass due to the ability to hydrogen bond between the hydroxyl groups. So if we come back over to the board here, we have a hydroxyl group, which if I draw this out a little bit more, we have a, oh, I might do that in the V-shaped orientation because that's what it's going to have, the nonlinear uh, alcohol. So we're going to have a delta negative here, we're going to have a delta positive there, lone pair of electrons on our oxygen. We can form a hydrogen bond between that and another alcohol. So say we got ethanol, we could form the hydrogen bond between the hydrogen and the oxygen of another uh, ethanol molecule. So if I got CH2 and then CH3, like that. And then my delta negative, due to the differences in electronegativity, oh, I got another lone pair of electrons on the oxygen there. Uh, difference in electronegativity, the oxygen is much more electronegative, holds the electron pair slightly closer to it, so it gives it a partial negative charge. So we can have a um, hydrogen bond between the delta positive and the delta negative. So recall that hydrogen bonds needs to be on a hydrogen bonded uh, to an oxygen, nitrogen, or fluorine, 
due to that um, much more increased difference in the electronegative values, giving it a strong or a stronger delta positive and delta negative. So if we compare that to other organic molecules that might only have the van der Waals forces, um, if it's non-polar, van der Waals being the weakest of our intermolecular forces, or dipole-dipole, if, uh, if they have a polar, but they don't fit the requirements of the hydrogen bond. So a stronger intermolecular force, we have relatively higher boiling points because it takes more energy to disrupt that force. They undergo a number of reactions that we're going to cover over the following two lessons. This lesson, we're going to look at combustion reactions, halogen substitution reactions, and the reaction with sodium. The next lesson, we'll continue this with oxidation reactions, dehydration reactions, and esterification reactions. So let's kick off with our combustion reactions. We've looked at combustion reactions with hydrocarbons before, and the good news is that the combustion reactions with the alcohols are quite similar. We're just doing them with an alcohol instead of a uh, hydrocarbon. So it involves reacting a fuel, a substance, a reactant with oxygen, and it's an exothermic reaction. We let off lots of energy in the form mostly of heat. The products of the complete combustion of an alcohol is carbon dioxide and water, so similar to that of a hydrocarbon. General equation here, alcohol plus oxygen, carbon dioxide plus water being the products. Here's your first task for the day. Pause and write a balanced equation for the complete combustion of ethanol. So you've got the general equation there. I'm telling you it's ethanol. You've got your products, complete combustion. You're making a CO2. Balance it. Check your answer when you push play. Hopefully you got something like this. So ethanol plus oxygen goes to carbon dioxide and water. And then just a simple matter of balancing that. One ethanol, three oxygens, two carbon dioxides, and three waters. During uh, complete combustion, ethanol will burn with a clean blue flame. Um, and similar to our hydrocarbons, our alcohols can also be used as a fuel because these exothermic reactions are generating lots of energy and we can convert that energy into different types of energy that we can harness for whatever use we want, whether it's powering a generator, whether it's running an automobile, etc., etc. So, particularly, Brazil, the United States, and Europe often use an ethanol blended with petrol called gasohol. Uh, Brazil has little access to oil, but can grow sugarcane for fermentation in the production of ethanol. So they can make lots of ethanol through that process, as opposed to using the hydrocarbons in oil, which is a limited access to them. It is considered a biofuel. Uh, what this is, is a fuel produced from biomass, um, in this case being a result of the sugarcane that's grown. Considered to be carbon neutral, because we've talked a lot about the detrimental effects of carbon dioxide on climate change, um, and it is increasing the greenhouse gas emissions, increasing the concentration of CO2, which is trapping more heat and causing the Earth's climate to change. However, the, these biofuels, especially this gas hole, is considered to be carbon neutral, which means that the overall carbon uh, footprint, if you will, from the production and from the use uh, sort of cancel out. Because when we grow sugarcane, that being a plant, it's going to uh, take in CO2 in order to grow. So the idea is that it's releasing the same amount of CO2 that it consumes as it grows. However, this is a bit of an oversimplification. I mean, you've got to consider all these other um, factors. You know, if you're transporting, if you're processing it, these are all going to add to the amount of emissions. So Bit of an oversimplification, but the concept of them leveling out is something that we can describe. Moving on now to the halogenation of an alcohol. This involves the substitution of the hydroxyl group with a halogen to form a halogenoalkane, a um, homologous series we've had a couple of lessons in. So we've got a delta positive charge on a carbon attached to the hydroxyl group that is susceptible to nucleophilic attack from the halogen. Let us consider that. So if we consider the um, difference in electronegativity, not in the hydroxyl group, but between the uh, carbon and the oxygen, we're gonna have a delta positive on the carbon and a delta negative on the oxygen um, because that's going to have a difference in electronegativity where oxygen, oxygen is the more electronegative uh, negative atom. So what this means is that if we have a nucleophile Nucleophiles looking for some sort of positive charge. We have an electrophilic carbon that's susceptible to undergoing a substitution reaction. And in this case, with our halogens, our halogens being quite successful 
nucleophiles when they need to be. So there's a number of reagents that we're going to look at that can be used to do this reaction. Let's have a look here. The first is looking at hydrogen halide, then we'll look at sulfur dichloride oxide, and then we'll look at uh, halide phosphide, phosphorus halides. So the first one, we've got the hydrogen halide, which is simply your, you know, your HCl, your HBr, your HI, you know, your hydrochloric, hydrobromic, hydrofluoric acid, etc., etc. So in this case, the halide acts as the nucleophile. We've got a nice delta positive uh, carbon for that nucleophile, and we can substitute the alcohol for the halide. Here's a general reaction here. If we have an alcohol, we react that with a hydrogen halide, we end up with a halogenyl alkane and the water. Pretty straightforward. We just swap the alcohol group for the halogen. So if I get you to do an example here, oh, actually, before, let's read this. So alcohol is heated under reflux to drive the reaction. We've discussed the concept of reflux before. Uh, allows you to supply heat constantly to increase the rate and favor the, um, you know, produce more of your product without losing those volatile organic compounds because we have the condenser tube. So constantly going between the gaseous phase and the liquid phase to increase the chance of successful collisions. Oily halogen alkane produ uh, product can then be distilled off and collected. So distillation, a separation technique based on the differences in the boiling point of the mixture. All right, here's your task. Write an equation showing the reaction of ethanol with hydrogen chloride. So if our alcohol is ethanol, if our hydrogen halide is hydrogen chloride, what would that look like? Pause, use the general equation, and it would make the chloroethane. So the ethanol, hydrochloric acid, we just swap, swap, substitute the hydroxyl for the chloro, and we end up with the halogen alkane, the chloroethane in this case, and water as our byproduct. Let's look at sulfur dichloride oxide, also called thionyl chloride. This can be used as a source of chlorine for the chlorination of an alcohol. Produces the halogen alkane, so we get the similar product here if we were using the HCl, um, but it's only for chlorinating, whereas this can be used for brominating or iodating, whatever halogen you want to put on. SOCl2 is just for the chloro. We also produce HCl and sulfur dioxide. Sulfur dioxide has got a particularly pungent uh, characteristic smell. If you think about a, um, a freshly struck match, that is that sulfur dioxide smell that you will uh, smell. <laughs> so what have we got? We've got whatever our alcohol is, our R chain just being whatever it is. We react it with our chlorinating agent, our SOCl2. We end up with the halogen alkane, HCl, and the sulfur dioxide. Now these are both produced as gases, so it's a simple reaction. There's no need to distill it afterwards because the gases, if you let it, are just going to evaporate and it's just going to leave our halogen alkane behind. So very useful indeed. No need to distill that one. Your turn. Write the equation showing the ethanol with our thionyl chloride, our sulfur dichloride oxide. Use this equation. I mean, all you've got to do is substitute in the R chain, really. Hopefully pretty straightforward. We start off with our ethanol, react it with the sulfur dichloride oxide. We end up with the uh, chloroethane and then HCl and SO2 as our byproducts. The final one are these phosphorus halides. So depending on what product we want, we can use a phosphorus, you know, a chloride, phosphorus, or a bromide, or the iodide. Useful reagents to provide halogen atoms. So again, the thing to remember is that all these halides, they're just acting as nucleophiles for that delta positive carbon, yeah? Uh, which is the one that we have in there. So our halides being our nucleophiles, and we can get the substitution occurring. So we get a number of examples depending on what halogen or alkane is desired. So for example, if we want to chlorinate it, we could use phosphorus pentachloride with the ethanol and we'll end up with the chloro, um, chloroethane and our byproducts are HCl and POCl3. If we use the phosphorus trichloride, the PCl3, we end up with the same, uh, same product that we want, the same halogen or alkane, but we end up with this phosphorus acid, H3PO3 as the byproduct there instead. Um, then if we want the bromo or the iodo alkane, we can just use the tribromo or the triiodo phosphorus compound. So the tribromo will end up with the uh, bromo ethane, triiodo will end up with the iodo ethane. And then what we note is that we end up with this phosphorus acid in each of these cases if we're using the tri uh, halide phosphorus, or if we're using the pentaphosphorus chloride, uh, sorry, the, the phosphorus pentachloride, we end up with the HCl and the POCl3. Final one for today, we're gonna to look at the reactions of the alcohols with the sodium. So, so far with the reactions that we've been looking at, 
we've been looking predominantly at breaking that carbon oxygen bond, but with the reaction with the alcohol, we're actually breaking the oxygen hydrogen bond. What do I mean by that? Let's have a look here. As opposed to removing the hydroxyl group, which is what we were doing with the other ones, uh, the reaction with sodium removes the hydrogen atom from the hydroxyl and forms the conjugate base of the alcohol called an alkoxide. So let's consider that. If we had some sort of alcohol like that, and then if we're breaking the oxygen-hydrogen bond, as opposed to the carbon-oxygen bond that we were doing with these substitution reactions with the halides just before, we would end up with a species that looked like this, and that's called an alkoxide, so ethan oxide or propan oxide, and would end up with a hydrogen atom that we've, uh, we've donated essentially. So this here would be acting as a Bronson-Lowry acid if it's losing the hydrogen, because that's what a Bronson-Lowry acid is, a hydrogen donor, a proton donor. So therefore this would be the conjugate base thereof, because that could then accept the hydrogen and it could form the alcohol, so act as a Bronson-Lowry base. Okay, so we've got a general reaction when we react with sodium. Alcohol plus sodium goes to the sodium alkoxide and the hydrogen. All right, why don't you just see if you can work this out for yourself based on what I've shown you over here, based on this general equation up the top here. If our alcohol is ethanol, what would this equation with sodium, what would this reaction with sodium look like? Pause, do that, check it. We would have the ethanol, we react it with the sodium, and we form the sodium ethanoxide salt and the H2, right? So the sodium is severing the oxygen-hydrogen bond, we end up with the alkoxide, and then that could form an ionic bond with the sodium plus and the O minus. So this is a less vigorous reaction compared to when the sodium is added to water. The sodium water reaction is quite spectacular, uh, lots very, very exothermic, this reaction is still exothermic, but much less vigorous compared to that water one. The longer the alkyl group of the alcohol, the less vigorous the reaction becomes. By adding an indicator, such as phenolphthalein, we can observe a color change to confirm the alkali sodium ethoxide that is formed. So we've got the sodium ethoxide here, the ethoxide, the ethanoxide, uh, could accept a the hydrogen, therefore it could act as a alkali, because that's what they do, they accept protons if they're gonna be a base. And that's what we could observe if we had an indicator that showed that. Final thing for today, we're gonna to look at some uh, identification reactions that we can do to identify the presence of different classes of alcohols. So we'll look today at how we can identify this secondary type alcohol where we've got a CH3CHOH there. And then we'll look at a similar one to um, distinguish tertiary alcohols from the other two in the next lesson. But let's start with this one here. We can use an alkaline solution of iodine uh, under heat to identify the presence of a secondary alcohol that is adjacent to a methyl group. So if we were gonna draw this uh, group that it can identify, it would look a bit like this. So we've got the methyl group, CH3. Then we've got the alcohol, the hydroxyl I should say, and then we've got a hydrogen there, and then we have the rest of the R chain. So it's it can identify this, which is a secondary alcohol, so it's not all secondary alcohols, it's this secondary alcohol, or in the case, one case, a primary alcohol, next to this methyl group. This will make a bit more sense as we talk about it, let's just keep going forward. So, what do we have here? A positive result, if we have this group in our molecule and we do this test, this test with the alkaline solution of iodine under heat, it will give a yellow triiodomethane, also called iodoform, it'll give this yellow precipitate. That'll be a positive result for it. All right, here's the method. We add iodine to a small amount of the alcohol, uh, followed by the minimum amount of sodium hydroxide to make it alkaline, to remove the iodine color. Sometimes heat will be required. And there'll also be a characteristic sort of medicinal smell that you might be familiar with if you do this test um, because this triiodomethane is used as an antiseptic. So if you've ever you know, scraped your knee or something like that and it's been washed out with this triiodomethane antiseptic to clean it 
it's got a very familial smell that you can identify with this kind of medical type uh, application. And it will confirm that we have this group that I drew out just before. So R can be any alkyl group or it can be a hydrogen atom. So I've just made a bit more space here. Let's redraw it here. So I got my CH3. Let's do some hybridization this time. Uh, like that. Then I've got the carbon with the hydrogen with the hydroxyl. And then we've got our R group. So R group can be any other carbon chain, which would then make that a secondary alcohol or the R could just be a hydrogen there. In this case, we would end up with a primary alcohol, ethanol. But this is the only primary alcohol that we can have this particular CH3, CH, OH group. So ethanol, because if R was a H, is the only primary alcohol that will give a um, positive result to this test. There we go. All right, so let's, let's look at the steps involved in the formation of this triiodomethane. Um, this iodoform that is called. So the first step involves the oxidation of the alcohol that we have, this particular group, into a ketone. So if I got my H3C there, I got my C, my alcohol, my hydrogen, and my R group. So we're going to get oxygen uh, oxidation due to the uh, sodium hydroxide and the iodine reaction. And that's a funny looking arm. Let me try that again. And we will end up with the ketone, ketone if R is a carbon chain, or, oh this pen's getting real bad, or it'll be an aldehyde in the unique case of our ethanol, um, which is our only primary alcohol to do this. Then following that, we have the hydrogen atoms on the methyl group get substituted with iodine atoms to form uh, due to the alkali iodine that's in the solution. So then, we get the iodine coming in and we get the replacement of these hydrogen atoms with three iodine atoms like that. And this is where this triiodo uh, methane is coming from. Then after that step, we get the further oxidation causes the carbon-carbon bond to break, forming the triiodo methane and a carboxylate ion as the sodium salt. So let's have a look at that. So then further oxidation, we sever that bond. Um, how am I going for space? I'll be able to do it here. We end up with the triiodomethane, CHI3. So if I draw that down here, that'd be a iodine, 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 still place, space, yep, and a hydrogen. So triiodomethane. And then we also get the carboxylate ion. So then we sever that, so we also end up with this, oh my goodness, pen's shocking, uh, carboxylate ion like this. And then whatever our carbon chain is there. So then, because we have the sodium hydroxide, this could make the sodium salt from the alkali solution of the sodium hydroxide that we have. So what we end up with is we end up with this triiodomethane that is a precipitate. And again, it can only form from this particular uh, part of a molecule. So if the molecule does not have this section, then we won't see that precipitate forming. So it's a identifying test for the presence of that. We're gonna revisit this test a little bit later on when we look at our aldehydes and ketones because it's useful for the testing of that carbonyl group there as well. But that's a little bit down the track. For now, we've finished this lesson. What have we done? We recalled the chemistry of alcohols exemplified by ethanol in the following reactions, combustion, substitution of halogen and alkanes reaction with sodium, classified the uh, hydroxy compounds into primary, secondary, or tertiary alcohols, and we deduced the presence of the CH3, CH, OH group in an alcohol from its reaction with alkaline, uh, alkaline aqueous iodine to form triiodomethane. Ooh. Tasks, pause there, consolidate, work through one at a time, top to bottom, and you'll be good as gold. Thank you very much. I'll see you next time when we conclude the hydroxy compounds for now. Have a great day.